Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webcast on improving your FCC or RFCC filtration and addressing the upcoming 2020 IMO regulations. Your speakers today will be myself, Pat Hill, Project Manager uh, Engineer at Mott Corporation. And Mike Ociani, Project Manager at Mott Corporation. So today we want to teach you all a little bit about uh, just some light overview on the upcoming IMO regulations and how they're affecting refiners and fuel producers. Uh, and then specifically we'll go into how Mott can help with that problem. So we'll talk a little bit on porous metal filtration capabilities and designs. We'll look at performance advantages over other types of filtration technologies. We'll look uh, to how, how to appropriately design your filter and what steps to take to ensure a successful design and commissioning process. So what do we want to know about the IMO regulations? Um, you cannot exceed more than half a percent of sulfur content in the ship exhaust, and you need to meet a particulate standard of 60 milligram per kilogram of aluminum plus silicon. And these are the these are where the high performance filtration solutions can come into place to help refiners. Right. So we're looking to remove aluminum silica catalysts, some other impurities in in the process stream of whatever's coming out of the bottoms of the reactors. Uh, and then you know similarly on the 0.5 percent sulfur content, this is typically achieved either with blending, so we'd be helping produce a higher quality fuel, or potentially if you're on board a ship with some sort of scrubbing, which is also going to require liquid filtration. So how's porous metal made? Uh, simply, we start with a powder. Um, what's unique about this powder, as opposed to other sintered components, is we're looking for an irregular shaped powder uh, rather than spherical with some sort of known geometry. We then take that uh, powder and we compress it through uh, a couple different methods, depending upon the, the process or, or product we're trying to make, uh, into a rigid structure, or we may 3D print it. Uh, 3D printing doesn't necessarily apply to the refining technologies, but it is a new area uh, and does open up a, a different stream of possibilities for product design. After we compress, we're going to center that product at a very high temperature for a pretty specific uh, amount of time and atmosphere, and that sintering process produces a very rigid component, uh, structurally bonds those particles together, gets you a stainless steel product that has uh, the strength you need uh, and the corrosion resistance you need for any particular application. To validate that we've made the right component, we bubble point and flow test our products to ensure that the porosity and average flow across them is uh, what we're looking for for a specific media grade. And we have media grades ranging from an average pore size of 100 microns all the way down to an average pore size of 0.1 micron. So we'd be looking to select a media grade that achieves acceptable filtration for a given particle size distribution, a given liquid stream application. What's important to note there is our media grades are not defined by a micron. It's, it's a nominal filtration value uh, that we are able to achieve. Um, in, in refining applications, you'll find that in liquid applications, we're typically using our media grade 0.5 to uh, maintain the particulate on the surface. In a gas filtration, we'll be using our grade 2. Um, our porous meters are available in multiple uh, alloys, including stainless steels, cast alloys, inconels, nickels, minels, and titanium. Primarily in, in the uh, refining business, we'll be using the stainless steel. So how do these elements differ from some other types of filtration technologies? So in, in this case, we're looking to compare against uh, maybe a, a paper element, a bag filter, or a polypropylene element. A sintered stainless steel element is cleanable, uh, meaning it can be cleaned in place, which we will discuss further in this uh, application, and it can be offline cleaned and rejuvenated for years on end or decades on end, depending on what that application may be. Because it's constructed from stainless steel, it's durable and it's corrosion resistant. It's also self-supporting, so it does not require any sort of inner liner. Uh, or any sort of inner support structure. The media itself is the support structure that acts as the substrate to do uh, the filtration. And because it's stainless steel, you can merely weld a, a variety of connections onto either end or weld the components together as shown in the picture on the right here to achieve overall length or connections specific to the process. Um, because of the durability that Pat mentioned, the, these elements can handle upwards of 3,000 PSI differential pressure and are capable of being operated from cryogenic to 1700 degree Fahrenheit uh, condition. And we'll custom design 
uh, your, your, we'll select a media that's appropriate for your application uh, based on the information that you provide us. Um, they have a variety of uh, porosities available and we can pretty much custom design these to any diameter and length uh, that you need for your application. The summary really on this side slide is that we're looking to design an element specific to the application. When we're looking at liquid filtration in refineries, we're looking, you know, probably 0.5 micron, potentially 0.2 micron, depending upon the specific refinery and, and amount of catalyst fines. And we're looking for overall lengths on the order of 60 to 80 inches. That tends to result in the most economical design configuration, which we will talk about in further slides. There's three types of liquid filtration uh, solutions that are available. Uh, the first one is the most common, the dead-ended filtration. This is where you have the flow passing through the filter element where it's closed at one end and you're building up a cake of solids while the permeate goes through the filter elements and exits the filter. Um, the next one is the low velocity cross flow filtration. This is typically a vertical filter where you're going to pass something like a high density solid through a lower density uh, fluid such that the, the particulate would settle or you may use it for some uh, concentration in a recirculation loop. Um, that's our high pulse LSM filter. Uh, last one on the bottom is our high velocity cross flow filtration. This is typically horizontally and used for um, for a high concentration of fine, ultra fine particulate, such as submicron particles. For FCC and RFCC filtration, specifically, we're talking about main column bottoms, slurry oil, decant oil, things of that nature. Uh, the dead ended filter is, is typically the most uh, high performing, most commercially economical. Uh, at, at MOT, we call that the LSI filter, which we will discuss in further slides and go through some operational modes. When it comes to gas filtration, uh, we do have a presence in the gas market, specifically at refiners. We have two main gas filter designs. The first design, the Gas Solids Venturi GSV design, is our most common application. And it is special in that it uses a specifically designed and patented sonic pulse to do online cleaning uh, that significantly reduces utility consumption, maximizes throughput, and results in a configuration where the elements are cleaned and rejuvenated uh, over and over again for days, months, years uh, on end. It is continuously operating and can handle a wide range of solids loading. The design is flexible enough that it can be designed for either upflow or downflow conditions. However, its limitation is typically face velocity limited to less than three feet per second. And the GSV can be configured in, in multiple ways. Um, some customers install these right on the nozzle on top of a, a, a catalyst hopper to just keep the solids in the hopper and prevent losing them into the atmosphere or downstream. Um, they can be standalone vessels. And um, the GSP, is, the difference between the GSV and the GSP is the ability to, uh, you do, to impart the high high velocity pulse to each individual filter element, uh, whereas the G in maintain online capabilities while the GSP needs to be taken offline for, blow for blowback. So we gave a little bit of an overview of the various types of filters uh, we design and see, you know, as part of our role here at MOT, but specific to refiners domestically or globally, um, we most commonly uh, solve two main problems. So we look at slurry oil separators, whether that's for an FCC or RFCC unit, uh, and what our liquid filters, our LSI filters achieve are typically 20 ppm or less total suspended solids in the feed. Uh, this does reduce uh, well below the limit required for the IMO regulations, as we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, our liquid filters are obviously able to operate at a high temperature, and we actually desire a high temperature. We're looking for process temperatures of approximately five to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, depending upon the actual breakdown of, and, and composition of that feed stream, amount of carbon, amount of catalyst, amount of uh, other inorganics, if you will. And what this does is sometimes it eliminates heat exchanging operations. We don't need to cool that fluid down before going uh, into the filter. And with our liquid filters, they are continuously operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, with the backwash basically, uh, being handled one of two ways. Either that backwash, the collection of solids from the filter is recycled back to the riser, 
uh, in which case it's dispersed from there, or it is sent for downstream disposal or reprocessing. We have customers that do either method. Recycling to the riser is typically a little more common, uh, but both methods are viable. Uh, in gas filtration, the most common applications are the third and fourth stage separators. Uh, these will be located downstream of uh, some centrifuges where you th they remove the bulk of the filtration uh, of the solids and are expended into the third and fourth stage separators before the catalyst is recovered for reuse or disposal. Uh, the hopper vent filters are installed in four different application locations the, for the fresh catalyst, the spent catalyst, and the uh, catalyst coming back from the regenerator. So they operate at both high and low, uh, low temperatures and have a high capture efficiency to ensure that there's, you, you, you capture, recapture most of the catalyst and do not have any emit into the uh, environment. So moving into liquid filtration specifically, the next uh, three, four slides will focus specifically on LSI operation. Um, the, you know, one of the main differences of, of MOT LSI filters versus traditional candle liquid filters is that we prefer an inside out filtration methodology. The inside out filtration feeds from the bottom of the filter up through the candle and the permeate exits on, on the backside of the candle. Uh, what this inside out filtration gives you is an even deposition of the cake along the surface of the media. Uh, as represented on the picture of the right. Uh, it also keeps the cake along the inside surface of the media, so you do not have the cake on one filter element interacting with the cake on another, which is called bridging. Bridging cuts flow, uh, reduces efficiency, and other sorts of bad things. So by keeping that, those solids on the inside surface, you eliminate that concern. The other thing inside-out filtration does for our elements is it plays to the element strength. Our elements are a minimum of two times stronger in the filtration direction than they are in the reverse direction. Uh, this usually results in us being able to go for a longer cycle time, capture more catalyst, backwash less frequently, and in the case of recycling to the riser, recycle less material uh, less often, so a better mass balance there. We do have liquid filters that operate outside in. We use them in, in a variety of uh, specific methods. Um, the benefit of the outside-in filtration is there's a certain comfortability factor of, of being the traditional design. And when it comes to backwashing, you are able to discharge the cake off the surface of that element slightly easier than the inside-out element because you're not constrained by the diameter of the element for that cake to, to fall into whatever reclamation device is downstream of the filter. The summary here is that we can really design for either type of application but when it comes to FCC and RFCC slurry oil filters, we prefer the inside-out filter. And you might ask when we'll use the outside infiltration, and that's most commonly used when we're doing uh, low solids uh, polishing applications. Uh, we're just trying to remove, um, remove a small amount of particulate at a, a high, higher velocity. And it's also used when we try to when we retrofit other filter media. Um, when you find that your the existing filter media, whether it be a screen or more coarse mesh, uh, we can we can manufacture a direct drop and replacement using our porous metal media to enhance your performance. All right, so this slide is going to be an inside-out filtration uh, example, specifically on the filtration cycle. I will walk you through the filtration cycle, and then Mike will talk about backwashing and the various backwash methods. So the cycle obviously starts with opening the outlet valve to the filter and the inlet valve to the filter. We then, like I mentioned, feed the bottom of the filter, the cone region, with our dirty feed solution. This is where our catalyst uh, is, is contained. That filters up through the tube sheet and solids deposit along the inside surface of the filter elements as we continue to produce clean filtrate. We build clean filtrate inventory on the secondary side of that filter up until we reach the uh, upper filtrate outlet nozzle, which is shown in that dark blue color on the slide. And that clean filtrate is then sent downstream for processing or further manufacturing if need be. We will continue to operate in this scheme uh, until one of three criteria is met. Either we reach a terminal differential pressure across the filter elements as measured on either side of the tube sheet. Uh, we reach a predetermined time. Uh, some customers prefer to backwash on a fixed time interval every two, six, eight, 24 hours, whatever that number may be or a backwash is automatically initiated by the operator. If the unit is being shut down or the operator wants to manually initiate a backwash for some other maybe mass balance or cleaning reason, uh, they will have the ability to do so. 
Uh, with respect to terminal differential pressure, I'll just mention that this is usually empirically determined uh, either in our lab with filter feasibility testing or on site with some pilot testing that we will discuss later in this presentation. When it comes to FCC and RFCC slurry oil filtration, we find a good number is typically around 60 PSI differential pressure. Uh, and that number will move up or down depending upon the amount of uh, catalyst in the feed stream versus uh, some other things like carbon, uh, coke fines, maybe some asphaltines, um, you know, whatever it may be. All right, we're demonstrating here is our full shell backwash cycle. So first we isolate the filter by closing the inlet and then the outlet. Then we open up the gas valve, leaving the liquid level in the filter to pressurize the pocket above the liquid. Then once the pressure is reached, we open the bottom valve to empty out the solids. So the high pressure of the gas pushes the liquid backwards through the filter elements. And that sudden opening of the valve, rapid opening of the valve, is where the pressure instantaneously knocks the cake off the filter elements. And then we leave that gas pressure on to help drain the slurry to the backwash receiver below. Uh, at this point, you're ready to resume the next filtration cycle. Uh, but I'd like to make a couple more points about uh, the capabilities of this backwash. So in the demonstration you saw here, we just backwash with the filtrate. But that, that filtrate may be of high value, or you may want to use a different backwash fluid um, that acts as a better solvent. So what you would do is you would drain the clean filtrate liquid out of the vessel or displace it um, with an alternate fluid. In the case of slurry oil, you might use something like a light or heavy cycle oil uh, to help dissolve any uh, residual asphaltines that might be um, remaining on the filter elements, and you would do a full shell backwash with that alternate fluid. Um, it doesn't necessarily apply to refining applications, but we do have other methods of backwash, um, in which case, you know, for some customers where the, uh, the cake solids might be their product. Um, we have something called the empty shell backwash where you drain the filtrate and only backwash with, with the gas. Um, you can take it a step further and drain the filtrate liquid and the feed liquid back to the tank, just leaving a wet cake on the filter elements and discharging that. Um, that's gonna be more valuable when you have high cake solids and, and the solids are your, are your product. Mike, when it comes to FCC and RFCC filtration, what sort of fluid, uh, if we're not using the clean filtrate, what sort of fluid might we use for an alternate backwash? Well, in that case, you'd use a heavy cycle oil or a light cycle oil, something that is a little more aromatic and can dissolve those asphaltines that might stick uh, to the vessel. It's more, more common when someone has a lot more asphaltines in their process and they're having trouble with the standard backwash using the filtrate. Uh, meaning um, you reach differential pressure much quicker, which results in a shorter cycle time or, or increased frequency of backwash. So the summary here on, on the backwash is really, we, there's variability with respect to the process, whether it's a full shell backwash or, or all the way to a wet cake discharge or whether or not we uh, displace our filtrate with an alternate fluid, right? Yeah, so what's common is a lot of the refinery applications have a higher flow rate so they typically are going to have a two or three filter system, um, in which case, you know, when you do the backwash and you're using alternate fluid, the backwash cycle could take upwards of 20 to 30 minutes, especially if you're going to allow that, that cycle oil to soak in the filter. So most common installation is to have three filter vessels where they're each designed for 50% of the design flow, and one filter is offline while the other two filters are online in service, and they just rotate uh, through the sequence. So that's all well and good. The filter's pretty cool to operate, but but what does it get us? Is is it worth uh, uh, the investment to you? So for FCC and RFCC slurry oil producers, we see um, typically less than 20 ppm solids, in some cases significantly less, uh, again, depending upon the specific product stream, which results in 98% plus recovery of valuable filtrate. In this case, that's filtered decant oil and 98% plus capture of alumina silica catalyst and other sort of solid particles. Uh, this is done with a passive system, relying on the flow already existing in the feed stream, so we're not worrying about adding extra pumps, extra heat exchangers, or extra complexity uh, to the overall design. 
So at, here at Mob, we like to take a graded approach to the filter design. Um, so for new applications or first-time porous metal filtration users, we like to do a demonstration test in our lab. Um, so we'll take a sample from the customer, um, we'll put it through a, a bench scale disk test to do some filter feasibility testing on the product. Uh, the next stage, once we've established that we can filter the customer's uh, fluid and establish the, the operating parameters, we uh, may do some on-site pilot testing where we send a single, single or multi-element uh, filter system out to the customer site, site. They install it in a slipstream and we go out and help them uh, start up the equipment, learn how to operate the filter and do some testing. Typically, this is something that runs two to three months in duration. And then the results of the pilot test scale up directly to a commercial design. So what we'd like to do first is, now that we have all the test results from the laboratory testing and pilot testing, uh, our engineers work together with your engineers to develop a design that suits the needs of your process. Um, go through that design package, uh, which includes developing uh, the size of the filter, the media grade that's used, the alloys that are used in the construction, um, and also the process behind uh, the, the filter operation, including a, a process and instrumentation diagram, a functional specification, cause and effect diagrams, and, and the like. And once we've gotten approval on the design, at that point, we have an implemented design system that we can provide a full firm price quote for and just build the equipment so you can get it on site quicker. Um, what would you say we've found with this process, Pat? Yeah, so the two biggest things that this process gets over just jumping immediately into the, the design. Uh, number one, time. Uh, this, this is typically significantly uh, faster and more streamlined than just jumping into fabrication. Uh, because we are structured and graded in our approach, um, we have less design iterations, uh, less back and forth, less change orders. And because of those things, the second biggest thing this gets is a reduction in risk. Uh, very early on for an extremely small capital investment, we can laboratory test uh, a customer's exact feed stream and have that initial go, no go on feasibility. If we pass that feasibility test, the pilot test, again, before jumping into major construction, gives another graded approach to understand how repeated filter cycles are going to be performed at the customer site at process temperature. So time and risk, uh, both mitigated through taking a graded approach. And what you'll see here is as we go through the process, you, know, you don't wait until the end to find out the price. Obviously at the end, you get the, our pencils are sharpened and you have a very accurate price, but once we've gotten through the lab testing, uh, MOD is able to provide a rough order magnitude design Coming out of the pilot testing, we can get closer to a budgetary uh, estimate, but once we've gone through that feed package, is really when we can give you a very accurate price as to what the equipment's going to cost to build and, 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 uh, and design. So now we'll just look a little bit at each of those with, uh, with the next level of detail, starting with the filter feasibility testing. So again, this is done at the Mott Lab here in Farmington, Connecticut, and what we get out of this is key critical performance data. We take a look at the solids, we look at a particle size distribution of those solids as shown in the bottom right image on the screen. From that PSD, we are able to accurately select the media grade to perform filtration. And then we perform that filtration in-house. So we'll run a liter or a gallon or sometimes maybe more uh, of your exact uh, slurry oil and we'll look for operational flux coming out of that. We'll look for backwash uh, effectiveness and repeatability. And from that flux, we can then calculate the necessary required filter area. The next stage is the pilot testing. Um, the advantage of the pilot test is we're testing the exact same filter element that is used in the full scale unit. So in slurry oil, our common uh, element is a two inch by 60 inch. This one might be a little bit shorter, but it is the same configuration. Um, the tests occur on site using process fluid. So you take out all the variables associated with sending your product into MOT. It's going to be at process temperature, uh, pressure, flow conditions, solids loading conditions. So it takes all the guesswork out and is easily scaled. Um, the test is performed by the end user operators with guidance from the MOT filter experts. So when, while we're on site, while we assist with the initial tests, we're teaching your operators and engineers how to use the equipment so that they feel confident 
in performing the test once we leave the site. Um, and we have the options to operate it manually uh, for best control or we can fully automate it for, for efficiency. Um, depending on, and what we find is a lot of our slurry oil application customers, because of the nature of the high temperature nature of the fluid, they like to have an automated system uh, because it's safer for the operators to use. Um, what this provides is valuable data that can be used to directly scale up to the full size uh, system. And after we have that pilot testing data, we're ready to, to go into a detailed design engineering phase. And really what, what comes out of that detailed design engineering phase is an optimized and improved design. One where we collaborate with your engineers, as Mike mentioned early, uh, and really freeze that design before we go to overall construction activities. Like I mentioned before, lower overall cost, less risk, uh, a, a significant reduction in change orders, and a better overall timeline for fabrication. So just a little bit of uh, detail on some of our slurry oil installs. Here's a, a partial reference list of our FCC and RFCC applications. As you can see from the list, it's a, a mixture uh, from around the world. We have FCC and RFCC units on five different continents. And we have designed for flows uh, as low as a couple hundred barrels a day, all the way up to 20,000 barrels a day in some applications. And with solids uh, from near polishing levels, a couple hundred ppm, all the way up to one to two weight percent. All right, the next slide shows a list of our installs for the uh, hopper vent filters around the world. As you can see, we're listed on both the UOP and Hoxins licenses. And you know these filters have been operating um, some for uh, over 10 years with great success. So that brings us to the end. We hope you thought these uh, couple of slides were informative and, and brought a little bit of information into the uh, upcoming IMO regulations and how mop porous metal filtration systems can, uh, can help solve those problems for you. Of course, if you're interested in learning more, feel free to contact Mike or I directly or simply browse the website and send an email to info at and we'll be happy to answer questions and help point you along the way.